Good afternoon, and uh, <clears throat> thanks for the invitation to speak here today. Um, I think it's, uh, it's no secret that uh, we live in, a, I think, very exciting times in uh, the era of medicine, where we're going from uh, current medicine, which uh, treats a condition, to personalized medicine, which is the future where we will measure something about patients and uh, tailor the treatments to the patient, and hopefully by that, uh, make them um, highly effective for uh, most people. Um, and so I'd like to uh, today tell you about um, a, few, um, a few projects that uh, we're working on um, in this uh, general direction. Um, I think we, we started in this, I'll just take this. Sorry. Yeah. So um, we started in this uh, direction maybe uh, about a decade ago in a project uh, called the a personalized nutrition project where for the first time we worked in the lab with uh, human cohorts. Uh, we recruited a thousand people. Um, we measured their blood glucose response to, uh, to food. Uh, and we also profiled them uh, with... Uh, and we also uh, profiled them with uh, uh, microbiome data and other uh, clinical data. And this was published, so I'll just uh, summarize the three key results. The first is that on a scale of a thousand people we saw that the, just the data shows that people respond very differently to food in terms of their blood glucose response. We were able to then uh, use uh, personal information about people to develop an algorithm that quite accurately predicts uh, these responses and in a two-week intervention show that uh, we can tailor diets to people that for the same person and the same amount of calories move him from spikes in glucose levels to fully balanced uh, glucose levels. And when we finished this, uh, the key question was uh, then whether uh, following these types of diets for a long term can have uh, clinical benefits, and that's a clinical trial that uh, we ran in the lab and completed recently on 200 patients with uh, prediabetes, randomized into either a standard of care diet or our algorithm diet, with the primary outcome being uh, hemoglobin A1C, or average glucose levels uh, across time. Uh, here's uh, one uh, patient on the algorithm diet as an example in the one month of uh, profiling his glucose levels prior to the intervention you can see many spikes and then during the first month of intervention we virtually eliminate these spikes and that persists for the six months of intervention and uh, summarizing uh, the results of these, this study which will be published soon um, we see that on the standard of care diet the panel on the on the left shows uh, after six months some reduction s significant reduction in hemoglobin A1C, but reversal back to baseline. And uh, we were happy to see that on the uh, algorithm diet, we got double the effect, and it also persisted in the next six months of follow-up. So for us, this completed a journey uh, from idea to through an algorithm and eventually to an actual, what we believe is a treatment for people with prediabetes. And we have uh, also results on people with uh, diabetes that, that really is a treatment that is personalized uh, to, uh, to the patient. Uh, and very, uh, very gratifying uh, for us. And uh, that kind of uh, gave us the idea to think uh, maybe broader, can we go beyond just nutrition and microbiome, and uh, can we use, in general, population-level cohorts to, uh, uh, to do personalized medicine and drug discovery? Uh, obviously, we're not uh, the first to uh, think about uh, this general direction, and I think one way to think about existing efforts is on these two axes of on the one hand, on the x-axis, the number of people one examines, and then on the y-axis, how, um, kind of how deep you uh, phenotype people. And ideally, we'd measure about uh, uh, everything on millions of people. Uh, that is uh, not attainable, of course. So short of that, there's uh, multiple different uh, efforts. There's um, uh, EHRs uh, uh, that uh, uh, Israel also excels in, and that we heard uh, great uh, talks about it uh, today, which has data on millions of people but um, uh, not so much in terms of molecular data. Uh, then we have, uh, in genetics, there's actually a lot of uh, molecular data in Israel, MyHeritage, in the US, 23andMe, and other companies that have access to uh, millions of genetic uh, profiles. But uh, other than that, uh, it's mostly uh, self-reported uh, data and uh, questionnaires, so not a lot of uh, additional molecular data. Uh, closer to what we're doing, there's uh, recently established biobanks. The most notable and I think an amazing project is the UK Biobank. Uh, almost, talk, almost talked about that. Half a million people tracked for uh, over 10 years now uh, with a lot of data. They have genetics. They have some more molecular data. 
but uh, even that project on half a million people can't go very deep. So we thought there's a sweet spot here that is much less covered, uh, where you still look at enough people, but you, you go much deeper. And, and so uh, that's the main focus of the lab today, has been also for the past several years, uh, what we call Project 10K, for trying to establish a cohort of 10,000 people, over 6,000 people we actually profiled, and uh, we're profiling them very, very uh, deeply. And what I mean by that is that um, we're profiling them both physiologically and also on the molecular level. At the physiological level, once people uh, come to an actual physical visit uh, at Weizmann, they undergo uh, several different tests to characterize uh, several systems in the body. So we use um, ECG and ABI to characterize the uh, cardiovascular system, uh, CGMs to look at metabolism. We get their uh, past history and medical record through questionnaires and, and data from Kupot Cholim. Uh, we use ultrasound to look at uh, fatty liver. Uh, um, we use uh, DEXA to do full body scan and look at um, um, bone density. Uh, we're using um, monitor, sleep monitor devices from Itamar Medical to monitor sleep during uh, three nights. People go home with uh, this sensor and also with uh, the CGM. Um, and uh, people track their diet on, a, uh, on an app. We biobank both uh, serum and PBMC so that later on we could do functional assays on live cells. We record uh, voice uh, because that also has uh, some correlation to, uh, to disease. Um, we're going to integrate soon uh, wearables. And on the molecular side, we're doing full genome sequencing at a shallow depth. That's what we can afford now, but it's, it is full genome sequencing. Um, we're doing uh, RNA sequencing, bulk at the moment. Um, there's plans, we're not doing that yet, to do proteomics. We are profiling the microbiome, both oral and gut microbiome. We're doing a serum uh, metabolomics in-house, so we uh, have a, close to 10,000 different features and, uh, in the blood that we can measure. And there's a unique uh, immunity, immune system assay that we developed whereby we can uh, synthesize hundreds of thousands of different antigens and uh, then assess uh, whether uh, uh, um, out of all of these hundreds of thousands of antigens, what uh, uh, the antibodies of a given person can recognize out of all of this. So if you will, that it's, it's looking at the infectious history of a person and uh, can look at also uh, interactions with uh, the microbiome with other um, uh, different exposures. Um, and uh, we're, uh, we're using, uh, we're, we're using uh, 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 taking fundus uh, uh, images to look at the, the retina. So uh, multiple different uh, systems uh, that you see we cover in the body, many different uh, molecular methods, uh, probably most molecular methods that one can do at scale uh, on humans uh, today. And of course, uh, the main question that we're, uh, we're asking are, I would say, two main questions. One is, can we uh, diagnose and can we identify disease before it manifests with clinical symptoms? And can we use this cohort for uh, also identifying causal biomarkers that potentially could give us uh, directions for novel uh, therapeutics. Uh, so distinguishing this correlation versus causation, obviously that's the, the billion dollar question, and we're approaching this in several different ways. I'll just uh, uh, highlight a few of the directions that we're going into. So um, we realized after a long time that even if you study a healthy population and 10K, 10K at its baseline is a, is a healthy cohort, there's actually variation in a lot of the risk factors, like some people who have a higher hemoglobin A1C and therefore are closer to developing di diabetes than others, and similar with every device that we measure, we have a lot of variation between people, so uh, one can identify biomarkers that explain these different uh, risk factors, and uh, if some of these, uh, and we have to do more work to characterize whether they could be uh, potentially causal, then uh, one can think of taking next uh, e experimental steps to uh, assessing uh, their, um, their actual effect. Uh, another approach is uh, to use our data, which is uh, quite complete, so it has many different layers of data, to learn different mappings between different types of data, and then go to other data sets that perhaps are bigger and perhaps have uh, followed people for a longer period of time, like the UK Biobank, and then impute certain layers of data that were not measured there. So for example, uh, we published um, uh, earlier uh, this year a paper uh, whereby using the microbiome data, we could show that we can predict with high accuracy several hundreds, actually, of different metabolites in the blood. And then using feature attribution analysis, uh, also uh, pinpoint some of the actual bacteria that may underlie 
uh, some of these um, associations. And so what one can then take these types of models to uh, another uh, data set that may be measured many, uh, much fewer uh, layers of data, but if they have, in this example, microbiome data, then we can use these models, impute the metab metabolomic data, and then see whether people that have higher predicted levels of some metabolites, say 10 years ago, whether they developed uh, disease in the future with a higher uh, likelihood, and, that, uh, and that's, that's uh, another way to do it. Uh, another way is, is the classical way of uh, case control studies, and so we are uh, also establishing, we have established also uh, some disease uh, cohorts. Um, as an example, uh, one collaboration we have is on acute coronary uh, syndrome uh, patients, so uh, patients after a heart attack. And here uh, we took a kind of a, a somewhat different uh, computational approach whereby we really focus on the patient. So we take a patient and we use the very large set of healthy people that we have to uh, find matched controls for this patient and matching, say, by age, gender, and BMI. And then uh, we can then compare and identify for each metabolite where does this metabolite uh, uh, reside in terms of its levels compared to the reference, uh, small reference cohort, the personalized reference cohort uh, for this patient. But one metabolite is very noisy, so we can do this for all of the uh, different metabolites that we measure. And, and then basically, we can identify the specific disruptions in uh, metabolite levels that occur in this particular patient. And we can then cross that with uh, the previous um, uh, work that I, that I briefly mentioned, where we identified different drivers of different metabolites. And we can ask, is there something common to these metabolites? So are these metabolites that are disrupted in this person, driven by diet, by genetics, by microbiome, and so on. And we can run this uh, type of thing for, um, uh, for every patient, and then for every patient, even though they resulted and ended up with the same clinical endpoint, in this case, acute coronary uh, syndrome, we can um, look at, for example, these radar plots that characterize the metabolic, metabolite disruptions in each patient and say that uh, even though they have the same clinical um, uh, outcome, patient, uh, the patient at the top has more disruption in uh, diet and traditional uh, type of uh, uh, risk factors compared to maybe the patient at the bottom where the disruptions in the metabolites seem to be more driven by disruptions in the microbiome. And that can also give us a clue as to where uh, we'd like to uh, intervene uh, in this patient. So this is a kind of new type of uh, uh, computational framework that uh, we're considering. Uh, I mentioned before that we can use our data to enrich other data sets. We can also do the reverse. So for example, in genetics, there's now very well established uh, polygenic risk scores computed and derived from hundreds of thousands of individuals. So we can import them and then uh, uh, project them on our cohort. And even though, say, we don't have uh, Alzheimer or Parkinson's patients in our 10K healthy cohort, we can uh, identify high and low risk individual for that disease uh, coming from these polygenic risk scores that we uh, import. And we can ask whether there's any molecular differences in these high versus low risk individuals five, 10, or 20 years before uh, they develop the disease. Obviously not everybody's gonna develop it, but if we have enough, uh, um, if we're powered enough, then we can identify statistical differences that may pinpoint to uh, specific uh, biomarkers. Uh, another area that uh, we're going uh, much deeper into, and I think um, is the most advanced in terms of uh, uh, bringing this to uh, uh, seeing the light and actually uh, going into experiments that uh, uh, we believe may have therapeutic uh, benefit is in, in the area of the microbiome. And so here, um, we're really uh, uh, working on a um, different uh, approach. So until now, most of the microbiome work, including ours, has been focused on uh, taking metagenomic samples, mapping them to a reference database, and then just characterizing the composition, either of genes or different species. And now, uh, with the availability, with the ability to look at thousands of different metagenomes, we could uh, drill down to a much finer resolution and do basically what people have been doing in human genetics and go down to the SNP level. But now, instead of SNPs that you're used to seeing in the human genome, do it at SNPs at the bacterial level. So now we're looking at variation in single positions in individual different bacteria, and we can associate them with uh, the many different uh, traits uh, that we have. 
And the general idea is, to, uh, is that this would be a discovery uh, a pipeline where uh, the result would be, as I'll show you in a moment, some strains of bacteria that may segregate between uh, the different trait. The idea would then be to isolate uh, these bacteria and then try to form a consortia out of them and then uh, go with them into uh, clinical trials. So um, I'll show you uh, an example of just a very simple trait, BMI. Uh, this is a standard Manhattan plot that you're used to seeing, but you're used to seeing this with genetics data. This is maybe the first one you're seeing with uh, microbiome data. So instead of human chromosomes, we have bacterial species. Every uh, uh, dot here is a, uh, a SNP, a bacterial SNP. You can see that the p-values are very significant, but p-values are uh, not that interesting. What's more interesting is the actual effect size, the statistical effect size, and we're seeing uh, really profound uh, effect sizes for individual changes in uh, positions in bacteria. So in the case of BMI, uh, you can see this volcano plot has uh, many, many different uh, SNPs that explain statistically one or two points of BMI, w which is a lot, could be four, five, or eight uh, kilograms of, uh, of body weight. And um, as an example, here's one bacterial species that, uh, that we identified. And here we identified 85, this is the x-axis here, 85 different SNPs that had a significant association with BMI. In this case, they also happen to cluster across individuals on uh, the y-axis. And uh, they really separate two different strains. And, and if you look, the 1,000 individuals that have what seems to be strain A versus the 300 individuals that have strain B, there's a difference of 2.3 points in BMI. So, so that, that's, that's a lot. And if, um, and I don't have time to, uh, to go into this, but we have reason to believe that um, these types of associations are causal, then one can think of um, uh, um, um, uh, inviting uh, one of these uh, patients and extracting and isolating the strain and using that as part of a bacterial uh, consortium. And, and here's another uh, type of, um, spe another uh, species where we're uh, also identifying strains that explain, in this case, one point of BMI. Here's another one. 1.3 points of BMI, and, and similar. Uh, basically, we can do this pipeline for many different, uh, um, many different traits. We find it for hemoglobin A1c, for, uh, uh, for many of the different uh, markers that uh, we are measuring, many of the different traits, we're finding these uh, associations. Uh, do I have two minutes? I do. I, I don't have. OK, so I will. Uh, not to talk about this. Uh, FMT intervention for atopic dermatitis that uh, seems very promising from the clinical perspective. And I'll just uh, jump to, I want to go one slide back. No? How do you go one slide back? Because, um, OK, there is a, let me try this. Ah, here we go, yeah. So uh, just the acknowledgment slide, the many different uh, collaborators. Uh, that we have on the project of uh, acute coronary syndrome. We're working with uh, Be in Bellinson and uh, the group of Ran Kornowski, uh, Eran Elinav on the um, uh, uh, personal nutrition projects I mentioned, and then uh, the many people in my lab, most of which uh, who are here, Orly and Michal on the personalized nutrition uh, projects, uh, Amit and Liron on the microbiome SNPs, and Noam on the uh, metabolite um, work. Uh, thank you very much. Okay, yeah, we have time for questions. How is it, how is it determined? Who, 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 who goes, who, yeah, how do we choose? So, um, so this cohort is uh, people in the age 40 to 70. Uh, we chose that uh, both to match the UK Biobank and also uh, because 40 is, uh, uh, we wanted a healthy cohort, so 40 is, a, is an age where uh, we're tracking this cohort, if I didn't mention, longitudinally, so it's an age where we expect in some reasonable time statistically that um, things will change in the health status, and 70 is not too old that we can still identify uh, people that don't have um, uh, a lot of comorbidities. Uh, so that's basically the choice. And then within that, it's you know, whoever comes. 
I think like most uh, cohorts that are establish established in this manner, I can't say that it's uh, accurate. Uh, it's definitely not in, uh, a representative sample of the population in Israel, but uh, I think this is, uh, this is what, um, what one can do with these types of cohorts. Thank you. Thank you.